podcast. I am Olivia. I'm Christy. And before we start today's episode, I wanted to talk quickly about something that I've just heard about. Earlier this month, a young gay man was brutally beheaded in Iran in an alleged honor killing committed by the man's half brother and other male relatives. Ali Reza Fazeli Monfarid, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, or Ali, 20, was killed after his family learned through a letter sent to the family's address that he had been exempted from military service because of his sexual orientation. Ali reportedly feared his family members and was planning to move to Turkey to live with his partner before he was lured to a remote location in the village of Barumi and was beheaded. I'm not going to go into the details because I don't want this to turn into a murder porn description of his death but if you want to know more details then you can look it up for yourself what I will say is that if you think these issues shouldn't matter because they happen across the world from you you're wrong because we currently live in the UK and we've only just banned conversion therapy here and if you think that we shouldn't offer aid and home to people seeking asylum from this kind of prejudice then you need to wake up We'll be leaving a link in the description below for Rainbow Railroad, which is a charity set up to help those in the LGBTQI plus community. And it's set up to help them escape state-sponsored violence. They have numerous ways you can support them. So there's really no excuse to go and support them and do what you can. So I'm going to leave that there and today and start today's episode. In an era where most of us seem hellbent on holding wrongdoers accountable, where cancel culture is widespread and there is a new revolution being started every week, and rightly so, why is it that we often find ourselves wondering why no one did anything sooner when disaster strikes? At the beginning of 2020, no one thought there was any way coronavirus could possibly reach us all the way here in the UK. And when talking to friends and family about the prevalence of of human trafficking, I often receive the response that it's not that common. It's something that only happens in lower income countries, despite the fact that human trafficking is the most prevalent epidemic of our time. So what is it that makes us turn a blind eye to issues and then act shocked when the worst is revealed? Why do we think we're untouchable? And if it's happening somewhere else, but not near us, that it doesn't matter. But what happens when we ignore something that's right in front of our eyes? That's when the idea of the bystander effect comes in. The best definition of the bystander effect is that the bystander effect happens when individuals do not offer any means of help to a victim in an emergency, mainly because other onlookers are present. It is a social psychological phenomenon where the greater number of bystanders there are, the less likely any one of them is to help. The presence of other onlookers and how they react determine how an individual would respond. When talking about the bystander effect, I have found that someone always mentions the case of Kitty Genovese, a girl who was stabbed to death at a party with multiple witnesses who watched and did absolutely nothing. But how true is that to what actually happened and what did we learn from a sociological and psychological perspective? So Catherine Genovese, also known as Kitty, was born on July 7th, 1935 in Brooklyn. Kitty grew up a New York girl and loved it so much that when her family moved to Connecticut, she opted to stay in New York without them, which is just my dream. <laughs> she, got, she got herself a job as a bar manager and lived in Kew Gardens. The independent woman that she was once told her father that no man could support me because I make more than any man. Kitty had a partner called Marianne Zelenko, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, who she met at an underground lesbian bar called Swing Rendezvous in Greenwich Village. This bar became the Olive Tree Cafe in 1969, and from what I can tell online, it's not really acknowledged as previously being a lesbian bar. After their first time meeting, Kitty left a note for Marianne saying, will you call me at the street corner booth at seven? The two fell in love and moved in together. The couple sometimes accidentally let their guard down in public, They would exchange a loving glance, maybe even grasp hands for a second or two. Then quickly they would stop. It's so sad. I know, especially for this episode where we just talked about Ali as well. Yeah, I just don't understand how. I understand that this wasn't, isn't today, but it's not exactly in the grand scheme of time. It wasn't a long time ago. I just don't understand how, like we spoke at Ali at the beginning of the episode, how in 2021 this shit can still be happening. I I don't understand it. Yeah, it's horrible. And it's like, I don't know, you know that pride a lot of the time is is viewed as like 
um, a party and a celebration of rainbows. And it is a celebration of life and love, but it's also such more of awareness and fighting for basic human rights, because that's what it is. It's not like a lot of people, well, it is, it is gay rights, but it's basic human rights. Like, I, I don't understand why this is hard for people to understand. And it's like you could have been born in any country at any time. And if you're born in the UK now, then luck, then well, hopefully you're not going to face a lot of prejudice. But you're so lucky for that to be your circumstance. If you're born anywhere else or at any other time, then loving who you want to love is that she's just like punishable by death. Yeah, it's it's disgusting. I feel as well like it was only like the seventies in the UK that homosexuality was um, made was stopped being classed as like illegal was I don't want to say made legal because that's such a shit thing to say because it shouldn't even be classed as illegal in the first place but yeah and it's like we still have honor killings in the UK today um I can't remember the name but we're going to be doing an episode at some point on it but it still happens but a lot of people I know who are part of that community they're the most loving just like nicest people I've ever known uh, it's, yeah, it, I hate it. And you even look at like people like um, was it Turing? Alan Turing. He was um, anyone who doesn't really know British history, um, he found he was in charge of the um, Bletchley Institute in World War Two, which is where they cracked like the Enigma code, and they kind of he kind of basically invented like the first kind of computer. In Britain, winning World War Two was like so de- detrimental to like Alan Turing and his work, and yet. To put him in jail because he was gay. Yeah. After he saved our country, they put him in jail for being gay. It's just such bullshit. I hate it. So on the night Kitty was murdered, Marianne was home asleep waiting for Kitty to return home. But sadly, at 3am on the 13th of March 1964, Kitty was walking home from work to her apartment in Queens when she was approached by 29-year-old Winston Mosley, who had been following her. He ran to her and stabbed her twice. Neighbour Robert Moser heard Kitty screams for help and yelled, leave that girl alone at Mosley. He fled the scene and Kitty turned a corner and out of view of the public and ran the rest of the way home. However, a few minutes later, Kitty's attacker returned to the scene. Shadowing his face with a wide-brimmed hat, he systematically searched the parking lot, the train station and an apartment complex, eventually finding Genevieve, who was barely conscious and lying in a hallway at the back of the building, where a locked door had prevented her from going inside. He continued stabbing her, he raped her and then stole $49 and ran away. In total, she was stabbed 12 times in a space of 30 minutes, during which multiple calls were made to the police. A woman named Sophie Farrar rushed to the entrance of Kitty's building, risking her life not knowing if the attacker was still there. Luckily for Sophie, he wasn't, but unfortunately for Kitty, her wounds were now fatal and she struggled for breath while Sophie hugged and cradled her. At 4.15 in the morning... Kitty died on her way to the hospital. The case didn't gain much traction. It took the police over a week to find Kitty's murderer, and police originally suspected Marianne of being the murderer. Marianne was questioned by Detective Mitchell Sang at 7 a.m. on the morning after the murder. She was later interrogated for six brutal hours by two homicide detectives, John Carroll and Jerry Burns, whose questioning centred on her relationship with Genovese. This was also the police's focus when they questioned the couple's neighbours. On March 19th, 1964, six six days after the stabbing, Winston Mosey was arrested for suspected robbery in Ozone Park, Queens, after a television set was discovered in the trunk of his car. Mosey's car was searched after a local man, Raoul Cleary, became suspicious when he saw Mosey removing the television from a neighbor's house. He questioned Mosey, who claimed to be a removal worker. However, after consulting another neighbor, Jack Brown, who confirmed that the homeowners were not moving, Cleary called the police. Brown disabled Mosey's car to ensure he could not get away before police arrived. That's such a legendary move, isn't it? I know. I don't know how he would have... I mean, I guess cars back in the day were probably easier to do this too, but I don't know how he did it. That's such a hardcore move though, isn't it? Just like disable his car, just casually do it. I know. I just imagine him like standing against the car with his arms crossed, just like, no, not going. (laughs) Yeah, just like casually, casual lean. <laughs> so a, de- a detective recalled that a white car had been reported by some of the witnesses to Genovese's murder, and he informed detectives Carol and Sang. 
During questioning, Mosley admitted to the murder of Genevieve and two other women. Annie Mae Johnson, who had been shot and burned to death in her apartment in South Ozone Park a few weeks earlier, and 15-year-old Barbara Kralik, who had been killed in her parents' Springfield Gardens home the previous July. So who was Winston Mosley and what was his problem? (laughs) (laughs) Pretty big one, I think, Olivia. (laughs) He was from Ozone Park, Queens, and was married with three children and had no criminal record. While in custody, Mosley confessed to killing Genovese. He detailed the attack, corroborating the physical evidence at the scene. He said that his motive for the attack was simply to kill a woman, saying he preferred to kill women because they were easier and didn't fight fight back. Real brave of you there, Mosley. Real brave. (laughs) I I know. He stated that he got up that night around 2am, leaving his wife asleep at home and drove through Queens to find his victim. He also confessed to committing between 30 and 40 burglaries. Subsequent psychiatric examinations suggested that Mosley was a necrophile. And for those of you that don't know, necrophilia is a sexual attraction towards or a sexual act involving corpses. Basically, yeah, it's just, I don't understand it. It is so gross. Randomly, I was speaking to one of my friends at the night and we were speaking about how during lockdown we rewatched Twilight. Like, we haven't watched him in years, but we've watched him during Twilight, like, during lockdown. Is Bella a necrophiliac? Because they're dead. But he's walking and talking. That's true. Um, But it's, like, if it's, like, towards corpses, then I guess you have to kind of, like, what is a corpse? It's, like, something without a heartbeat? I don't know. But if a corpse is defined as, like, well, then that, then that would be a vampire, wouldn't it? No, no, but it's someone who's not, it's like a stone cold body that's got no heart beating and isn't breathing. I guess. I mean, it's not like he's going through decomposition. (laughs) I kind of think she is then. But then it's like, if he was alive enough to be able to birth a child, well, he didn't, but he helped. Yeah, your face right now is the exact face that I made when my friend raised this point. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I kind of laughed about the idea of like when we were teenage girls reading this book. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that was just basically a book about necrophilia. <laughs> Shall I do a quick gig? Shall I do a quick side gig? <laughs> I think I'm going to have to Google it. Tom, so you know how Bella in Twilight like falls in love with vampires and she like has a baby with the vampire she's in a relationship with? Oh, never mind then. <laughs> There's an actual poll on the internet, I kid you not. Um, so, <laughs> 79% of this fan pop poll, so clearly very scientifically done, say so that's factually incorrect. I feel like this is probably quite like Twilight fans that have voted on that. <laughs> 17% say factually correct. And 3% say a matter of opinion. I mean, I feel like whether someone's dead or not isn't really so much of a matter of opinion. It's just a fact. Right, well, we'll post a poll on our Instagram so everyone go follow us and take part. (laughs) (laughs) Let us know if you think that the swans are not (laughs) I'm going to go with yes. I'm just going to... Yeah, I'm going to go with yes as well. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Slight (laughs) sidetrack. So... Yeah. On March 18th, 1968, nearly four years into his life sentence, he escaped while being transported from a local hospital where he was receiving treatment for self-inflicted injuries back to prison. This is wild. He stole the transporting officer's weapon and fled to a nearby vacant home. He stayed in the residence undetected for three days until the owners, a married couple, dropped by to check on the house and found Mosley. He held the couple hostage for more than an hour, tying up the husband and raping the wife then taking the couple's car and fleeing once again sounds like some horrific john travolta movie it does yeah. <laughs> or like a oh what's like um quentin tarantino movie yeah what an utter dick honestly and then on march 22nd he broke into another house and took a mother and daughter hostage for two hours before releasing them unharmed and surrendering he was later given two 15-year sentences to be tacked onto his life sentence. In the 1970s, he participated in the Attica prison riot. Episode coming soon, so subscribe. And later on, he earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in sociology. <laughs> it's so random. 
He became eligible for parole in 1984 and was thankfully denied, in part because he claimed that his notoriety made him a victim and a worse victim than someone like Kizzy Genovese, who was a victim for an hour or so, but his victimization went on indefinitely. What the front door? What? He also claimed that he never intended to kill Kitty, despite what he told investigators in 1964, and that the murder... What, so the knife just fell into her like 12 times, did it? Oops, it slipped. Oops, it slipped again. Oh no, it went again. Shut up. What a dick. (laughs) And he said that the murder was simply a mugging that had gone bad. I mean, like, I could understand if, like, he'd pushed her down and she'd hit the back of her head. I mean, you're still a dick for mugging someone. But you stabbed her multiple times. Like, that's not a mugging gone bad. And raped her. Yeah. That's, like, a vicious assault and murder. That's what you decided you were going to do that night, not mug her. So New York Times editor Abe Rosenthal was drawn to the case of Kitty specifically because of the witnesses. Police had interviewed 38 people and five testified at trial. Two weeks later, on the 27th of March 1964, the New York Times published an article titled 37 Who Saw Murder But Didn't Call Police. This was later changed to 38 Who Saw Murder But Didn't Call Police. After seeing this, people started to see this case and New York as a failure of mankind and a reason to lose faith in humanity. How could that many people hear a girl cry for help and watch while not not a single person did anything to rescue her? However, this article has now been recalled because although 37 may have heard her screams, none of these were actual eyewitnesses and there were in fact multiple calls to the police. Michael Hoffman, 14 years old at the time, swore that his father... Samuel had called the police and after three or four minutes of being on hold, he reached a police dispatcher. This phone call wasn't recorded by the police department and they didn't respond to his call. And perhaps if they had responded, Winston wouldn't have seen no help was imminent and returned to the scene. So this case um, was a big factor in the 911 system being set up because before you just called your local police station and hoped that someone answered, but now you could call to a direct line and have a police officer come directly to you. So I know this episode is on the bystander effect and I've just dismissed one of the most famous examples of it because of the misinformation surrounding it. So I'm going to talk about another case where the bystander effect was no doubt in play and it's worth mentioning that I couldn't find an awful lot on this case as the victim survived and was just 15 at the time and it was horrific. So this case is referred to as the Richmond High School incident. On October 24th, 2009, at about 9.30pm, at the conclusion of the homecoming dance, a classmate invited a victim to join a group of males ranging in ages from 15 to late 40s who were drinking alcohol in a dark courtyard on the campus. The female victim drank an undetermined amount of brandy by choice and was propositioned for sex by the alleged attackers. When the victim refused, she was placed on a nearby concrete bench and continuously beaten and raped for two and a half hours, at times with a quote-unquote foreign object. They also poured alcohol down her throat. Approximately 10 men gang-raped the 15-year-old student, all while 10 others stood around laughing and taking pictures with their cell phones. The crowd eventually numbered more than 20 and no one called the police. No one went inside to tell a security guard or a policeman, several of which were on campus at the time. A little earlier, the assistant principal looked out of his office window and saw 12 to 15 grown men sitting around near the scene of the crime, none of whom had identification badges as is required and none of whom appeared to be a teenager. What are 40 year old men doing with teenagers in the first place? I know. Like, what's wrong with you emotionally that you still hang around with teenagers? It's like the fact that no one called them out on this either. Um, And the assistant principal didn't call the police either, and he didn't alert any teachers or students. He returned to his job and ignored them. The victim was found unconscious under a picnic table and was airlifted to a hospital in critical condition. She was released from the hospital on Wednesday, October 28th. So if you're not convinced that the bystander effect was involved, here's a quote from someone who watched, and you tell me if there's no diffusional responsibility here. 
They were kicking her in the head and they were beating her up, robbing her and ripping her clothes off. It's something you can't get out of your mind. I saw people like dehumanizing her. I saw some pretty crazy stuff. She was pretty quiet. I thought she was like dead for a minute, but then I saw her moving around. I feel like I could have done something, but I don't feel like I have any responsibility for anything that happened. How can anyone as a human turn their back on something like that? How? How? Like, how can you not do something to help? If you're, I can understand if you're scared to intervene with such a violent attack, but you know, the 911 system had been set up by this point, as per the previous case we just discussed about. Just call 911, alert the principal that's already noticed these guys and done sod all about it, get someone there to help. Like, it's not difficult. And it's like there were people filming it with their cell phones and yet at so several disgusting. points people thought she was already dead. What's wrong with them? What, what, what is wrong with people? How can you just stand and film someone be what they believe to be raped and beaten to death? It's disgusting. Lots of people at this event made so many excuses for why they didn't ask for help. So seven male suspects had been arrested in connection with the case. One of the initial suspects was subsequently released without charge due to lack of evidence. This initial suspect has since claimed that he was merely a witness present at the scene and that his intent was to help the victim, including offering her his shirt. Shut up. I know. However, he said that he did not contact authorities because he lacked his cell phone and was afraid of retaliation for snitching. (laughs) Oh, what? You're going to get disowned by your friends because you snitched on them, so it's perfectly okay to watch and just beat and rape a girl to death. You really need, like, priorities, people. Sort your priorities out. So, to round off the episode, I thought I'd throw out some facts about the bystander effect. B. Huntsnet actually have an excellent summary on their website, which I'll link below. When... So one of them is when there are four or more people who are bystanders to an emergency situation, the likelihood that at least one of them will help is just 31%. And in terms of excuses, the most commonly used are, I don't care. It's too risky. I'd be embarrassed if it ends up not being an emergency. It might be awkward to help when no one else is. Someone must have already called for help. It isn't as serious as it seems. Everyone else is so calm. And I have no time. But if you're one of the people who won't want to help and has been a bystander, here's some info for the future if you're even in this scenario. So number one, call the police. And then study first aid for if there's an unconscious person. And then as quickly as possible, check for breathing and a pulse. Draw attention to the attacker to scare them off. So one example is Darren Frost, who stopped a suicide bomber on London Bridge with a narwhal tusk. We've talked about this several times, but he incited others to leap to action and also joined in and scared him off and stopped him from detonating um, the bomb that was strapped to him. And then if you're not familiar with first aid, call an ambulance. And even if you are, call an ambulance anyway. Also ask if you're in a crowded sheet street or anything shout is there a doctor is there a nurse can anyone help just raise awareness of the fact that someone is in need of attention so if you act fast you can incite others to join in and help you and the victim and always remember it's always your responsibility to help someone in need but some of you um, may not like the documentary type scenario although you listen to true crime podcasts i imagine you do but if you're not too keen on documentaries about stuff like this. I really do recommend a film. Um, it was made in 1988, so it's a bit older. It stars Jodie Foster and it's called The Accused. Now, this is about, it, there is a pretty horrific gang rape scene in it, so I will put that out there to start with, but this perfectly um, encapsulates the bystander effect as to what happens when a horrific attack is happening on someone involving multiple people and there's multiple witnesses that do nothing. Some just turn around and walk away and some just leave them. And I really do recommend you go and watch this because it it follows her struggle afterwards of trying to find peace with the situation, find justice in the situation. So really do recommend you all go check out that film. Yeah, also really like, I know that the emergency services are strained right now, but this is what they're here for. So if you ever have any doubt that someone's in trouble, always call Mm -hmm. the police or the ambulance. Yeah. Because that is what they're here for. It is. And I would much rather someone try to help me than avoid me. 
if I was in need of aid. Yeah. And it's also worth saying, why do you think us as women are told to yell fire and not help? Mm. Because of this, because people do not want to get involved. Yeah. It's horrific. You're being brutally attacked. And we're told, don't scream for help, scream for fire, because no one will come for you if you scream help. And those are the exact words that we're told. How is that acceptable in today's society or in any society around the world at any point in time? It's not. And people say we don't need feminism anymore. Even in today's society where we live, you're meant to yell fire instead of help because people want to help you more. Yeah. It's it's, It's just utterly shocking. I just, I don't understand anyone's mentality to stand by and watch something like that. And I was just an innocent bystander. I didn't do anything wrong. If you stood there and watched someone, or if you even worse, film someone, get attacked in such a brutal way and did nothing, even if you just heard it, you, you do have something to be accountable for. I'm sorry, but you do because you could have you could have stopped that. You could have, you could have saved someone's life, and you chose to just turn a blind eye and not get involved. And that is such a systemic problem throughout all cultures and societies in this world today and just look out for each other people it's really not difficult just to have like the smallest grace of humanity within yourselves to do it it's also like for reference like that we talked about it the other week the i love you now die documentary yeah she didn't physically kill him but had she not been there or like had she not done what she did then he still would have been alive like she still yeah. influenced it yeah definitely 100 percent. and also even if it like it's not embarrassing if you call the police or the ambulance and there's nothing wrong it's actually quite a really noble heroic thing for you to do by your pint after <laughs> yeah exactly but it goes back as well as to what you're saying olivia about the issues with things like human traffic and stuff in today's society the um modern slavery is such a horrific issue at the moment like there's so many people like i think they estimate like hundreds of thousands of people in the uk stuck within modern slavery it's horrific and it's it's so sad and if you are living near someone or you see something you think is something wrong tell someone because the only way things these people who operate slave trade human trafficking all that can exist and keep going is by people turning a blind eye and saying nothing and doing nothing like you know the dark net or the dark web whatever you prefer to call it it's something like 95 percent of the dark net is taken up by human trafficking Mm. 95% that's horrific and it's a multi-billion dollar and I really don't want to call it an industry but I don't know what else to call it well it's very organized yeah oh it's so organized like it's 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 just absolutely horrific and again you you hear so many stories of um, these amazing stewardesses on planes and stuff who see a young girl being trafficked and they notice something's wrong and, and they get them to safety But unfortunately, for every one child or one girl or one boy, anyone who's been human trafficked on a plane, the bystander effect takes place and Mm -hmm. the person sitting next to them on the plane or the train doesn't say anything. The stewardesses on the trains or planes don't say anything. And they're taken out of a country and they're smuggled away and they're sold into sex trafficking, to slavery. And it's it's really serious issue. Be alert, be vigilant. And if you really don't want to be a bystander, go and support Rainbow Railroad, as we were talking about in the beginning of this episode. Yes. They're doing some really amazing work to get people out of situations which would have them murdered just for who they get to love. It's so horrific. I just don't understand it. I really don't get it. I don't get it at all. It's so stupid. It's the same as like people um, in this country as well. And I know it's, it's quite a big problem in this country, I think as well in America. Um, who are being killed and beaten up for being trans for being transgender and fuck off what what like I just don't understand someone living their life the way they wish to live and being happy and enjoying life and just how how accepting that person is just that person is affecting your life or your way of life in any way possible it doesn't just Mm. don't be a dick just don't do it and it's like anyone in that LGBTQI community would be so accepting of anyone else and we only mm. owe it to them to be the same right so I think we're going to wrap the episode up today <laughs> we're just going to keep ranting all day today if we do 
I hope you leave here feeling a bit wiser. Probably. I think it's going to be more like angry at the world. With yeah, this one, I, think. I definitely yeah. feel angry. I meant to say yeah. at some point as well, like cleanse your auras, get grounded, have tea, just like calm yourselves, but do that now. Yeah, I've like caned my tea and I really wish I had like something stronger for this episode. Mm. Well, I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good to know. So yeah, we will um, see you next week. We're heading actually off to my home county of Aberdeenshire next week. Oh, so that's I'm exciting. To that one. Yeah. And don't forget to follow us on the socials and leave an Apple podcast review for us. And we'll see you next time. Yeah, and please vote on our poll on Instagram. We want to know if you think Bella's next week. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> bye. Right, bye.